a very good evening aspirants as prelims is fast approaching i have a very good news to share with you all see the main step to succeed in the upsc preparation is to check your progress for that you need to attend the mock test am i right realizing this the shankar ias academy has come up with the all india prelims mock test which is completely free for you and it is held across 13 centers in both online and offline mode see there are three all india mock tests that is available in free mode note that it is freely available so kindly utilize it and check your progress of preparation so that you succeed with bright colors in this upsc prelims say if you ask me the dates for the all india mock test there are three mock test one will be on may 15th second will be on may 22nd and the third one will be on may 29th friends kindly make use of this opportunity to analyze your preparation and enrich your preparation with the three mock test that is completely free okay so now with this good news let's get into the hindu newspaper analysis for the date 4th of may 2022 displayed here are the list of news articles that i have chosen for today's discussion see if you had watched my video in the series cracking the upsc in the right way you would have come across the scheme swamitva which i said i will discuss today so today my discussion will be first about the swamitva scheme then about the news article discussion then we will deal today with a previous year preliminary question followed by our practice questions okay and see today all the topics that i have chosen is very much relevant for your preliminary examination so kindly utilize this video to brush up your economic concepts as well as utilize this opportunity to be aware of whatever comes in the news so now without wasting much time let's get into the samatva scheme discussion see the question that i gave for you to practice was a three statement question am i right now before answering the question look at this ad it talks about the samatva scheme look at the ad carefully and as i said analyze the ad each and everything in the ad has to be analyzed even the logo of the government of india the ministry of panchayat see these all can be very much important because whenever you look into a scheme if a question is asked like the scheme is under the control of whom you can easily answer by looking at the ad carefully okay now have you gone through this ad now come back to the question look at the first statement it is correct because it is implemented by ministry of panchayat raj see as i said in the ad itself the ministry of panchayat raj is mentioned am i right so this statement is correct then look at the other two statements see the other two statements are talking about the objectives of the scheme in the ad also you can see the objectives of the scheme is put up as key points am i right just by knowing the key points of the objectives or key points of the scheme itself you will be able to eliminate the wrong statements and arrive at the right answer see now in our question the statement 2 and 3 are correct the statement 2 which says creation of accurate land records for rural planning is one of the objective of the scheme is correct because in the ad itself you can see that the land parcels in rural inhabited areas are mapped using drone technology and cors which means these are all being recorded so your statement 2 will be correct now look at the third statement if it's implemented it helps in reducing property related disputes see this exact statement is given in the ad itself okay so this statement is also correct so as i discussed with you in the video if you just look at any ad which is related to some policy or scheme of the state or the central government analyze the ad if you can gain some awareness about that scheme or policy then it will be very much useful for attempting your preliminary based question also i said how to utilize these points in your mains answer see if you have any doubt regarding how to utilize this kind of information just watch my video in the series cracking the upsc the right way okay now let's move on to the first news article discussion look at this news article the news is regarding the sedition law its constitutionality has been challenged in the supreme court through several petitions and now union government has sought more time to file its reply to these petitions so now what is sedition sedition literally refers to the offense related to the conduct or speech that is 
inciting or encouraging people to rebel against the authority of a state or government so you can understand that it is a offense related to the authority of a state or a government okay which is the sedition law it is the draconian section of the indian penal code that is ipc that deals with sedition we are talking about section 124a of ipc c it defines what constitutes sedition actually the original ipc 1860 did not have a provision for sedition rather it was inserted only in the year 1870 the reason behind its insertion was to punish an act of exciting feelings of disaffection towards the government but this disaffection was to be distinguished from disapprobation see disapprobation means strong disapproval the differentiation was necessary to enable people to voice their feelings against the government as long as they projected a will to obey a government's lawful authority okay here they are coming to say that you should be allowed to express your feelings against the government but at the same time you should obey the government's lawful authority okay so what constitutes sedition as per section 124a anything which brings or attempts to bring into hatred or contempt towards the government will constitute sedition also anything which excites or attempts to excite disaffection towards the government is sedition here anything constitutes words which could have been spoken or written then it includes signs and also visible representation like you can say pictures or images see disaffection includes disloyalty and all feelings of enmity the above mentioned conducts are punishable under this section note this they are punishable under this section okay two punishments are prescribed one is imprisonment for life long with or without fine the second one is imprisonment up to 3 years with or without fine but does the section satisfy the intent with which it was enacted see in the letter of the law actually yes intent is satisfied since the section also states what does not constitute sedition This includes comments expressing disapprobation of the measures of the government or the administrative action. These are not to be constructed as sedition. Plus, the Supreme Court also clarified in Kedarnath Singh case of 1962 what constitutes sedition and even lessened the severity of this action. In this case, no, the Supreme Court upheld the validity of Section 124A. along with this it also held that as long as the criticism or comment of a citizen does not incite people to violence against government established by law or the criticism or comment is not with the intention of creating public disorder it would not constitute sedition so after this judgment no public disorder is considered a necessary ingredient of sedition but we know that the reality is different because often disapprobation is taken as a reason to charge someone with sedition therefore sedition law is often misused by the government to punish those who are critical of the government thereby curtailing their fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression that is why many petitions now seek to declare section 124a as unconstitutional So that's all about this news article. See, we have utilized an opportunity to discuss what is sedition, then what is the law that speaks about sedition. See, this is very much important for your prelims as well as mains. So make use of all these points for your UPSC preparation. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this text and context article. The article talks about India's federal structure. What is federalism? Federalism is a form of government in which the power is divided between a central authority and various constituents. Usually, a federation has two levels of government. One is for the entire country that is usually responsible for a few subjects of common national interest. The next is at the level of the states that mainly deals with the day-to-day -day administration of the state. Okay? The thing to note here is that both these levels of government enjoy the power independent of the other so this is the federalism in the traditional sense 
Now the question is, did India adopt federalism in its truest sense? No, India adopted a form of federalism that is unique. In Indian federalism, the levels of government are not independent of each other, but they are interdependent with a bias towards the center. That is, the states are more dependent on the center. The Indian form of federalism can be called centralized federalism. This article here mainly focuses on this. It focuses on the reasons that made India choose this Indianized version of federalism. Okay? Then it proceeds to talk about how majoritarian tendencies that are prevalent in India today are undermining the unique and asymmetrical form of federalism that India adopted. So in this discussion, let us look at the points mentioned in the article in detail. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference. Please go through it. First, let us see the uniqueness of Indian federalism. Normally, in case of a federal country, it is the states that come together to form the country. The classic example for this is the USA, that is United States of America. In the case of the USA, it is the states that came together to form the nation. So, in the USA, federalism is applicable in the truest sense. But this is not the case with India. Am I right? In the case of India, the word federation is not even mentioned in the constitution. And we know that Dr. Ambedkar called India's federation as a union. As in India, the Indian union is indestructible while the states are destructible. Okay? See, even though the Supreme Court in the SR Bommai case in 1994 held that federalism is one of the basic structure of the Indian constitution, in the Kuldeep Nair vs. Union of India case in the year 2006, the court held that in case of Indian federation, the centre has the upper hand. Having seen the uniqueness of Indian federalism, now let us see some of the unitary features in the Indian constitution. First, take Article 3. See, Article 3 of the Indian Constitution says that the union is allowed to alter the boundaries of a state without the state's concern. Second, take the emergency provisions. See, the national emergency under Article 352 and President's Rule under Article 356. Both are unitary features. Next is the concurrent list under the 7th schedule. In the concurrent list, the union government has precedence over the states. Some other unitary features in the Indian constitution includes unequal representation of states in the Rajya Sabha, integrated judiciary, single citizenship, governor's appointment and the all India services. See, having seen the uniqueness and the unitary features in the Indian constitution, now let us see why India opted for centralized federal structure. First is the partition of India and the associated concerns. See, post partition, the Indian national leaders opted for a strong union government to safeguard the integrity of the nation. As we already discussed, India is not a coming together federation like the United States. Rather, India is a holding together federation. Only by having a strong center, the disintegration of the nation can be avoided. Am I right? Now, the second reason is to forge a strong civic national identity. In India, as we know, there is a lot of diversity. In addition to this, Indian society is strongly hierarchical and discriminatory. So, Jawaharlal Nehru and Dr. Ambedkar believed that by having a strong center, the social hierarchy in the society can be dismantled. They also believed that a strong center can also help fight poverty better. Now, the third reason is our nation builders believed that a strong center will help establish a welfare state and a universal rights-based system. The fourth and the final reason for adopting a centralized federal system is to remove regional economic imbalances. When India was under British rule, there was huge regional disparity. Development happened only around Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta and Madras. To bring balanced regional development, a strong center was necessary. Even the Bombay Plan 1944 put forth by the leading industrialists of that time seek a centralized system to foster socio-economic rights and safeguards for both the working and entrepreneurial classes. 
See, these are the four points mentioned by the author that prompted India to adopt a centralized form of federalism. The author of the article, while concluding, feels that the current form of federalism in the Indian context is largely a function of the intent of the government of the day and the objectives it seeks to achieve. It is because of the right intention linguistic reorganization was possible. But presently, the central government is turning the unique Indian federalism into a highly asymmetrical one. This, according to the author, is a bad precedent. So, that's all about this news article. So, in this article, we discussed about the Indian federalism in detail. See, the uniqueness of Indian federalism and the unitary features in the Indian constitution, all these can be asked as a preliminary question. Also, this topic is very much important for your mains. So, kindly make use of all these points to enrich your mains answer. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. The news article provides data about the Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, that is PMI. Let us know what is it to understand about the article. First, know that Purchasing Managers Index, that is PMI, is a survey-based economic indicator. It is designed to provide a timely insight into the business conditions and the health of the global economy. PMI is widely used to anticipate changing economic trends in official data such as GDP. It is also used as an alternative to know about economic performance and business conditions. Okay? Thus, PMI data are used by financial and corporate professionals to better understand where economies and markets are headed. And note that it helps them to uncover opportunities. See, PMI is compiled and produced globally by a company called IHS Market. The index is produced for more than 40 economies worldwide. But then, why news mentions as S&P Global India Manufacturing PMI? It is because IHS Market has merged with another company called S&P Global. Therefore, IHS Market is now part of S&P Global and together they deliver data, technology and expertise that accelerate progress. Okay? Coming back to the Purchasing Managers Index, know that originally PMI was compiled for manufacturing sector only. Later on, it was extended to include other sectors such as services, construction and retail. Okay? Since today we are discussing data on manufacturing PMI, we will see what is it. It is simply mentioned as PMI which is also a survey based economic indicator designed to provide a timely insight into changing business conditions in the goods producing sector. Okay? This PMI is a weighted average of 5 indices. What are those indices? New orders, output, employment, suppliers delivery times and inventories or stocks of goods purchases. Okay. See these five indices are very much important. Just go through it again. Okay. Here new orders refers to the level of new orders received this month compared with the situation one month ago. The level is calculated based on units and not money. Okay. Domestic and export orders are included in this definition. Then suppliers delivery times is the average length of time agreed to deliver the goods this month compared to last month. Similarly, output is the volume of units provided this month compared with the last month. After receiving data on all these, the PMI is compiled. If the index reading is above 50, then it indicates an expansion in business activity. So with this basic understanding, let us see the news. It talks about India's manufacturing PMI. It is 54.7 for April 2022. Since the reading is above 50, it shows the expansion of business activity in India. Am I right? So this was mainly caused by acceleration in new orders and output in April month. There were quick increases in factory orders. Therefore, factories continued to scale up production at an above trend pace. Okay. This shows there was an improvement in the business confidence levels along with certain caution. So that's all about this news article. See this purchasing managers index is an important economic topic that is why I took and discussed it today. And as prelims is fast approaching this topic is going to be very much relevant for that. 
So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this article here. It says that a special bench of the National Green Tribunal has directed all states and union territories not to raise or construct hard structures for erosion control. This is because they can cause adverse impacts on upstream or downstream. And this is according to the report by National Institute of Ocean Technology that is NIOT. The report says that there is a need to replace hard structures like sea walls and groiners with softer options like beach nourishment, sand bypassing, dune planting and offshore submerged reefs. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about the National Green Tribunal in prelims perspective. See, the National Green Tribunal was established in the year 2010. It was established as per the National Green Tribunal Act 2010. It is a specialized judicial body that is equipped with expertise solely for the purpose of adjudicating environmental cases in the country. That is, it is established for effective and expeditious disposal of cases that is relating to environmental protection, conservation of forest and other natural resources. Okay. So, it also includes enforcement of any legal right relating to the environment. Then it has the provision for giving relief and compensation for damages to persons and property. See, it is a specialized body that is equipped with necessary expertise to handle environmental disputes involving multidisciplinary issues. See, we know that the environmental cases involve multidisciplinary issues and these issues can be better addressed in a specialized forum. So, recognizing this, the Supreme Court Law Commission and India's International Law Obligations recommended for setting up a tribunal. This is to develop national laws on environment and implement them effectively. Also know that the tribunal shall not be bound by the procedure laid down under the Code of Civil Procedure 1908, but it shall be guided by principles of natural justice. The tribunal's order are binding and it has the power to grant relief in the form of compensation and damages to the affected persons. Okay. See, this is a very important point. The tribunal's orders are binding. Okay. Now, let us see about the composition of the tribunal. See, the tribunal has a presence in five zones, which is the north, central, east, south and west zone. In this, the principal bench is situated in the north zone, headquartered at Delhi. And the central zone bench is situated in Bhopal, east zone in Calcutta, south in Chennai and the west zone in Pune. The tribunal is headed by the chairperson who sits in the principal bench and has at least 10 but not more than 20 judicial members and at least 10 but not more than 20 expert members. Okay. With this basic knowledge, we should also know about the jurisdiction of the tribunal. See, any person seeking relief and compensation for environmental damage involving subjects in the legislation mentioned in Schedule 1 of the National Green Tribunal Act 2010 may approach the tribunal. See, there are seven statutes in Schedule 1. They are given here for your reference. Just go through it. The tribunal has jurisdiction over all civil cases involving a substantial question relating to environment. Additionally, any person aggrieved by an order or direction of any of the appellate authorities under the legislations mentioned in the Schedule 1 can also challenge them before the National Green Tribunal. Okay? So, that's all about this news article. So, we have seen about this National Green Tribunal in detail. This will be very much useful for your prelims. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It says that the forest department has directed the Jog Management Authority to get environment and wildlife clearance from the Standing Committee of the National Board for Wildlife. This is for the proposed tourism development project at the Jog Falls in the Shivamoga district. According to the article, State Cabinet has already approved the construction of a 5-star hotel at a cost of nearly 120 crore apart from a ropeway. And these developments are in addition to other development works at a cost of around 185 crore under the Triple P model that is Public-Private Partnership model. See, the Forest Department has stated that the area proposed for diversion is situated in the Western Guards and it's categorized as Open Forest Eco Class 1 
tropical wet evergreen forest this is as per the forest conservation guidelines and it is a part of a unesco world heritage site that is why the forest department has asked the jog management authority to get clearance so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn some facts about this jog falls see the jog falls is a waterfall created by the sharavathi river and is situated in the sharavathi valley in the dense evergreen forest of the western ghats it is situated close to the shivamogga district in the state of karnataka jog itself is a kannada word which means falls it has a total height of 253 meter and the jog falls is the third highest waterfall in india after the nohakalikai falls and the dudsagar falls it is also the tallest untired waterfall and the second highest plunge waterfall in india jog falls is also referred to by various names such as the gersopa falls gersopi falls and jogada gundi The Sharavathi River rises in the Western Ghats in the small town of Ambutirtha in the Shivamogga district. The Sharavathi River flows over rocky terrain and gives a powerful plunge downwards, splitting into four separate cascades. The four separate cascades known as Raja Rani Rover and Rocket merge to form the huge waterfall on the Sharavathi River. The four cascades are colloquially known as Raja or Horseshoe Rover rocket and rani that is queen or ladami blanche the white lady see these names are based on the unique characteristics of each cascade the jog falls is unique because here the water does not stream down the rocks in a tired fashion but instead it rushes down the slopes without losing contact with the underlying rocks the lush green surroundings also enhance the beauty of the waterfalls The river water flowing to the Jog Falls is controlled by the Linganamakki Dam which has been constructed for hydroelectric power generation. As a result, there is a drop in the water levels during the drier seasons. But depending upon the amount of rainfall during the monsoon season, the amount of water flowing down the Jog Falls dramatically changes. So that's all about this news article discussion. See in prelims you may get a statement regarding jog falls or you may get a question where the falls name and the state name is given as pairs so that is why we took this opportunity to discuss about this jog falls with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see this article here it says that the ministry of housing and urban affairs was approached for providing a suitable piece of land for the construction of a permanent office for lokpal but it was informed that no suitable land is available for allotment so due to non availability of land the office of lokpal proposed to procure built up office space from the national buildings construction corporation india limited which is at the world trade center so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn more about lokpal which is very much useful for your upcoming preliminary examination See India is a signatory to the United Nation Convention Against Corruption. The commitment of the government to provide clean and responsive governance is reflected in passing of the legislation and creation of the body of Lokpal to contain and punish acts of corruption. See the Lokpal is the first institution of its kind in independent India. It is established under the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act 2013. It is to inquire and investigate into allegations of corruptions. It inquires into the allegations of corruption against public functionaries who fall within the scope and ambit of the Lokpal and Lok Ayukta Act 2013. See the Lokpal of India is committed to address concerns and aspirations of the citizens of India for clean governance. It shall make all efforts within its jurisdiction to serve the public interest. and it shall endeavor to use the powers vested in it to eradicate corruption in public life with this basic understanding now let us see about the membership the lokpal consists of a chairperson and members who shall not be more than 8 in number note that the person to be appointed as a chairperson of the lokpal must be either the form of chief justice of india or the former judge of the supreme court or an eminent person with integrity and outstanding ability 
and note that he must possess special knowledge and a minimum experience of 25 years in matters relating to anti corruption policy public administration vigilance finance including insurance and banking then law and management See, out of the total members, fifty percent of the members shall be judicial members. The remaining fifty percent is the non-judicial members, and the judicial members of the Lokpal must be either a former judge of the Supreme Court or a former Chief Justice of the High Court, and at least half of the Lokpal members must be from the scheduled caste or scheduled tribes or other backward classes, minorities, and women. Know that the chairpersons and the judicial members are appointed by the president on the recommendation of a selection committee. The selection committee consists of prime minister as the chairperson and the speaker of the Lok Sabha, leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha, then chief justice of India or a judge of a Supreme Court nominated by him, and one eminent jurist as members. Having seen that, now let us see about the jurisdiction and powers of Lokpal. See the Lokpal has jurisdiction to inquire into allegations of corruption against public functionaries who are or who have been in the office including the prime minister or you can say minister in the union government MPs and officials of the union government and a group A B C and D also functionaries of any board corporation society trust or autonomous body either established by an act of parliament or wholly or partly funded by the union or state government or also covered under the ambit of lokpal then it also covers any society or trust or body that receives foreign contribution about 10 lakh okay having seen the jurisdiction now let us see the powers of lokpal see a complaint under the lokpal act should be in the prescribed form and must pertain to an offence under the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 which is against a public servant there is no restriction on who can make such a complaint when a complaint is received the lokpal may order a preliminary inquiry by its inquiry wing or any other agency or it may even refer it for investigation by any agency including the CBI which is the Central Bureau of Investigation See the Lokpal is vested with the power of search and seizure and also powers under the Civil Procedure Code for the purpose of conducting preliminary inquiry and investigation. Also note that it has the power of attachment of assets and taking other steps for eradication of corruption. Also note that Lokpal will have the power of superintendence and direction over any central investigation agency including CBI for cases referred to them. by the lokpal so that's all about this news article discussion see this full topic of lokpal is very much important for your prelims and each and every points that i had discussed can be put into a preliminary question so make use of all these information and with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article see this article talks about unemployment According to the author after years of refusing to acknowledge that India has a job problem the government of India has now resorted to misinformation in the face of increasing evidence to the contrary this work has been supported by government affiliated academics here the author is talking about two things firstly about nso's employment and employment survey and nso's periodic labor force survey Secondly the author talks about two different news articles about unemployment which was published in two different days and two different newspapers here the information about the articles is not important but according to the author both essays show an inadequacy in understanding the job situation so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us quickly go through some of the important facts mentioned in the article before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference please go through it firstly the author talks about the worker population ratio and labor force participation rate both the surveys that is the nso's employment and employment survey and nso's periodic labor force survey claimed that between 2017 to 18 and 2019 to 20 the worker participation rate and the labor force participation rate was rising and showing improvement in the labor market So now let's know about these two terms that is worker population ratio and labor force participation rate. See persons who are either working 
or employed or seeking or available for work during the reference period together constitute the labor force labor force participation rate is defined as the number of persons in the labor force per 1000 persons or in simple words it is defined as the section of working population in the age group of 16 to 64 in the economy currently employed or seeking employment okay note that people who are still undergoing studies housewives and persons above the age of 64 are not reckoned in the labor force and what does this term worker population ratio mean it is defined as the percentage of total workers to the total population or it is the number of persons employed per 1000 persons hope you can appreciate the difference between the two terms see first term is inclusive it includes the entire working population or labor force in the age group of 16 to 64 in the economy who are currently employed or seeking for employment okay whereas when you take the second term it is exclusive that is it only includes number of persons employed per 1000 persons now coming back The two surveys claimed that between 2017 to 18 and 2019 to 20 the worker participation rate and the labor force participation rate was rising and this was showing improvement in the labor market. So here comes the question how come these rates were rising exactly when the economy was slowing down sharply from the year 2017 to 2020? See according to the author the reality is that this rise in worker participation rate or the labor force participation rate is misleading it was caused mostly by increasing unpaid family labor mostly by women another dubious argument is presented to support the notion that organized formal employment is increasing claiming that new employment provident fund registrations have increased in the last 2 years See one drawback of this EPFO the Employment Provident Fund organization based payroll data is lack of information on specific existing contributors. See employees join, depart and then rejoin resulting in constant EPFO enrollment modifications. And just with the increase in number of registrations cannot project actual increase in employment rate. So to conclude according to the author covid-19 has resulted in a tremendous increase in unemployment of at least 10 million people which is on top of the 30 million people who are already unemployed in the year 2019 this occurred when the CMIE that is the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy Private Limited reported that the unemployment rate has dropped from nearly 43% in 2016 to 37% in just 4 years Poverty had already risen prior to COVID, and it had risen even more after COVID, according to all estimations. And according to the author, we have to accept this sad reality and take suitable measures to have an actual increase in employment rate instead of manipulating data. So that's all about this news article. See, whatever we discussed here, like the. labor force participation rate or the worker population ratio all these no can be put into a preliminary question as these all comes under economic topic discussion i have taken this news article today so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next part of this news article discussion which is the practice question discussion see today as prelims is fast approaching i have enhanced our video discussion with the previous year preliminary question discussion Now look at this question, which I had taken from the year 2017 prelims. See which one of the following is not a feature of Indian federalism? See today only I had discussed about the Indian federalism, the unique features of Indian federalism in length and breadth. Am I right? So you can easily answer this question from that discussion itself. See now the answer for this question is yes, you are right. Option D is the right answer. They are asking which one of the following is not a feature. That is why your answer is option D. It is the result of an agreement among the federating units is wrong. Okay. See, as we all know, the Constitution of India establishes a federal system of government. It contains all the usual features of a federation. Remember, as we said in the discussion, the Indian federalism is unique. And moreover, the term federation has nowhere been used in the Constitution. An article one, on the other hand, describes India as a union of states, which implies two things. One is Indian federation is not the result of an agreement by the states. 
And the other thing that you have to understand from this is no state has a right to secede from the federation. So from this itself we can understand that the answer for this question is option D. Whereas option A, B, C are nothing but the features of Indian federalism. So those points are all correct. Okay. Now let's start our practice question discussion. Take this first question. It is regarding the National Green Tribunal. It is a two statement question. See the first statement is correct. This is because the National Green Tribunal has not been vested with powers to hear any matter relating to the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Also, it does not hear the cases that is related to the Indian Forest Act 1927 and various laws enacted by states relating to forest, tree preservation, etc. etc. See, if you had just listened to the discussion carefully, I would have mentioned what are all the statutes that are coming under the NGT. Am I right? You can easily say that statement 1 is correct. Now look at the second statement. It is incorrect. As we saw in our discussion, the tribunal was established in the year 2010. And it was established under the Act, National Green Tribunal Act 2010. Okay. Now come back to the question. It is demanding for correct statement. So your answer here will be option A. One only is the correct answer. Now look at the second question. It is regarding the sedition. It is a three statement question. Now look at the first statement. Sedition as an offence under the IPC existed before Indian independence. If you had carefully listened to the discussion, you will know that this statement is correct. See in IPC, it was included after a decade of enactment of IPC. That is in the year 1870 only, sedition is included as an offence in the IPC. Whereas IPC was enacted in the year 1860 and the sedition was included in the year 1870. So this statement is correct. And look at the question. It is demanding for incorrect statements. So you can easily eliminate option A and B which has statement 1. Okay. But still you have to go through the rest of the two statements to arrive at the correct answer here. Okay. Look at the second statement. It is absolutely incorrect. See, there is no mention of sedition in the Indian constitution. Because during the constituent assembly debates, there had been serious opposition for inclusion of sedition as a restriction on the freedom of speech and expression, which was under the draft Indian constitution. Such a provision was termed as a shadow of colonial times that should not see light of the day in free India. So the constituent assembly was anonymous in having the word sedition deleted from the draft constitution. And as a result of this vehement opposition in the constituent assembly, the word sedition does not find a place in our constitution. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now look at the third statement. It is also incorrect. See, capital punishment is not prescribed. Rather, imprisonment for life or up to 3 years with or without fine is prescribed. Okay. So now what will be your answer? The question is demanding for incorrect statements. So, your answer will be option C, 2 and 3 only are the incorrect statements. Now, look at the third question. It is regarding our jock false discussion. It is a two statement question. So, we have to go through both the statements for arriving the answer. Look at the statement 1. See, it is incorrect. This is because the jock falls is the third highest waterfall in India after the Nokalikai falls and the Dudsagar falls. This we saw in our discussion itself. And it is also the tallest untired waterfall and the second highest plunge waterfall in India. Now look at the second statement. It is also incorrect. Why? See, we saw in our discussion that it is situated in the Sharavati Valley in the dense evergreen forests of the Western Ghats. So the part which says it is located in the Western Ghats is correct. But note that it is situated close to the Shivamoga district in the state of Karnataka and not Kerala. So the first half of the statement is correct but towards the end which says it is present in the state of Kerala is incorrect. Okay. So you can conclude that statement 2 is absolutely incorrect. Now look at the question carefully. It is asking for incorrect statement. So your answer here will be option C. Both 1 and 2 are incorrect. Now look at the last question. It is regarding our Lokpal discussion. It is a two statement question. Here you have to go through both the statements before arriving at the answer. See, look at the first statement. It is correct. 
The Lokpal is the first institution of its kind in independent India and it was established under the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act 2013 to inquire and investigate into allegations of corruptions. Now look at the second statement. See, it inquires the allegations of corruptions is correct. This we saw in our discussion itself. But note that it inquires into the allegations of corruptions against public functionaries who fall within the scope and ambit of the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act 2013. Then you may ask who all will come under this. See, this includes the Prime Minister, Minister in the Union Government, MPs, then officials of the Union Government and the group A, B, C and D. Also, the functionaries of any board or corporation, society, trust or autonomous body either established by an act of parliament or wholly or partly funded by the union or state government. They also will come under this ambit of Lokpa. Then it also covers any society or trust or body that receives foreign contribution about 10 lakh. Okay. So you can conclude that statement too is incorrect. And look at the question carefully. It is asking for correct statement. So your answer here will be option A. One only is the correct statement. Now displayed here is a quiz question for you. Go through this question and post your answers in the comment section. And the correct answer for this will be posted within 24 hours in the comment section itself. Okay. And now look at this mains practice question. See go through this question and write your answers and post it in the comment section. If you like this video, do like, share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.